Friends, the Bentley Continental range has been updated for 2016, and being this is Bentley's most important car, where should we drive it? Now, the obvious choice is the country roads of its homeland. But being since 2003 alone, Bentley has sold over 52,000 Continentals, we need something extraordinary. We need something with scenery. We need a place with epic roads. Now, this may not seem readily apparent at first, but we will prove throughout this entire episode what we need is the west coast of Norway. So let's start with the biggest change, and that is the engine. The 12 cylinder now has 582 horsepower and 531 pound feet of torque. Now, do you remember our Ferrari California T episode? where we spent a lot of time talking about taxes. I know what you're thinking, why are we talking about taxes when we're dealing with a Bentley? Well, it turns out different tax schemes around the world are affecting development of these engines. So really, this is no exception. What Bentley has designed in now is a cylinder deactivation. So this 12-cylinder can now run on six cylinders, and that affects the MPG. The combined cycle in Europe is 20 MPG, where on the US cycle, it's 15. But there's another change that that cylinder deactivation affects, and that's the CO2. Remember, we talked about different countries on the world that have a CO2 tax scheme. So this one is now in a lower band at 329 grams per kilometer. Now, you're thinking, well, it's still six liters, so what about China? Well, can't help you here. That's why they have this. This is a four liter V8. They've had this engine before, but now there's two versions. There's a V8 and V8S. So the V8, 500 horsepower and 487 pound-feet of torque, and the V8S is 521 horsepower and 502 pound-feet of torque. Now, depending on the version you're going for, top speed ranges from only 191 miles an hour to a top speed over here of a coupe hard top at 199 miles an hour, zero to 60, four, seven, something like that over here, down to four, three over here, especially with this cool one that has carbon ceramic brakes. So we're driving this stunning road in a Continental GT Speed W12 convertible. And can you see this? Look at that. Oh my God. Oh. I I know I'm not the one that's ever uh, left without words, but at this point, I am left without words. The stunning beauty of this place, uh, it's almost more breathtaking than the car I'm driving. But while we're here, let's discuss the driving dynamics of this and the V8S. Now you're probably thinking, why are we talking about the V8S when you're in the biggest, baddest Continental GT out there? Um, well, there's a good reason for that. The suspension modifications that were pioneered in this car are now in the V8S. Okay, great, so what are those? Well, if you look at a base V8 or a base W12, they have the same suspension setup. But in the Speed and the V8S, you get stiffer dampers, bushings, springs, and anti-roll bars. So how does that translate to roads like these? Well, notice, let's get some speed here. Go around this turn a little hot. And the car, this is not a small car, I think we'd all agree, completely balanced going around a declining radius turn like this. And yeah, I am in the sport mode, and I'm going pretty fast here. I'm not going to tell you how, how fast. But the car has complete composure over the base car. So one of the biggest differences between bespoke built cars like this and serial production cars like Toyota Camrys is life cycles. So you look at the life cycle of like a Toyota Camry, it's about five years. As a matter of fact, as of late, they've gotten a lot shorter to four years now because there's so much competition in that arena. Where here, this is more timeless design, so the design stays current a lot longer. So when there are changes, they're definitely more subtle. So you look at this here, the front grill, it's a little bit smaller. The, the front valence, the opening is a bit bigger and it's sculpted differently. We're coming around here to the fender and take a look at the B here. They've, they've 
grafted on a stylized bead. Now we first saw this in the Flying Spur, but this one's a bit bigger. And when you take a look, especially with these wheels, it really stands out. Speaking of the wheels, there are two different wheels on offer. There's a 20 and a 21 inch. Then if you have a V8 or a V8S, there's a new rear diffuser. And then all of them have a more sculpted trunk lid or boot, depending on where you live. closed the road for us here, so I decided to pick the V8S, and there's a reason why. We talked about driving dynamics in that uh, green Speed W12, but I wanted to get back at this car for a reason. There's lower weight, but the thing about this, it's not just the lower weight, it's one of those instances where one plus one does not equal two, it equals five. You've got lower weight, about 50 or 60 pounds less, but it's over the front wheels. So 50 or 60 pounds less combined with all of that improvement, so the stiffer suspension setup, the, the dampers, everything, um, make this thing so much more dynamic and you can almost throw this thing around more. And it's kind of funny to say throw around and Bentley in the same sentence, but just look at how flat this car corners as opposed to even that speed 12 we were driving somewhat aggressively, not as aggressively as this though. Uh, but also, there's this engine, the V8. So in our S65 episode, we talked about the characteristics of 12-cylinder engines. I don't care who makes them, whether it's Bentley, Mercedes, anybody, they're lazier, lower revving engines. Not bad, just lower revving engines. Where this thing, this screams a bit more. So this, combined with the lower weight, combined with the stiffer suspension setup, makes this so much more lively than the W12 or even the Speed W12. I'd almost go so far as to saying is this is the one I'd probably have. Okay, so what else is new for 2016? For that, we need to check in with Natalie. She has all three interiors of the 2016 Continental. So this actually is from a 2015. This is what it used to be. This is the, uh, the diamond quilting and they still have this in the flying spur. Notice how big it is. But now they do this like tighter fluting in all of the Continentals, the coupes. Uh, but then let's say you want something a little bit more special. You can still do the diamond quilting, but it's much tighter. It's like a, kind of like an Italian suit on the inside. There are some other changes, but we need to check them out somewhere else. Okay, so there's a couple of other changes on the interior, and this one is courtesy of Cherie. She just finished this dashboard for us. Uh, basically, there are new gauges. Uh, the shifter paddles are slightly more fancy. There's aluminum trim here that's knurled. And this is a Bentley, so you're expecting like hand-built like sewing and stuff like 19th century technology. Well, this now has Wi-Fi in it, a Bentley. Now there's another change that they made in 16 that they don't talk a lot about and to me is incredibly important and they did some ECU retuning and this isn't just for the 12 where they've obviously done the, the cylinder deactivation. In the 8 what they've done, recalibration of the ECU so like if I go to downshift here you get a little burble out of the exhaust so they did that specifically, listen to that. So this one's got the sport exhaust which is optional, I highly suggest, I mean forget about suggest, it's compulsory. If you buy the V8S, you kind of need the sport exhaust, but it works in conjunction with that retune on the ECU, and you get this very cool bark and burble as you're going down roads like this. It's like, you really wouldn't think about a Bentley as a track car, but this thing, <laughs> I would totally take this to the track. So the 2016 Continental is a technological marvel, but really, this is a Bentley. You're not buying technology so much as you're buying the history, you're buying the story. So what's the story with the Continental? Well, it started sort of with this, the 1952 Type R. And I don't know if I've shared with you in the past, but my, my heritage is Greek. And I'm very proud to say that there is some Greek heritage in this car. You see, the story goes, there was a famous race car driver, Greek, living in Paris um, that was driving Bentleys. And he basically went to Bentley and said, your cars are great and all, but they're not sleek enough. So he came up with this. He bought a chassis, had the, uh, the poor two body people put this body, stunning body. This car still exists, it lives in Northern California. 
If you've been to a Concours recently, you've probably seen this car at many different shows. Uh, and Bentley was so intrigued by this, they built this car in-house. And notice the front, it has a very Chrysler airflow look to it, so they were going for this more aerodynamic look. And this was 38, 39, this car was, was built. Um, but then World War II happened, so this kind of fell off the shelf, literally. It like, fell into the ocean, the body, and then the actual chassis itself made it back to Bentley and was turned into this, Olga. And this was the prototype of the Type R. And the concept was, have a Bentley that can go across the continent, hence the name, uh, at 120 miles an hour. Now, to give you a basic idea of what that meant, normal cars around that time were doing 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. So this was a spaceship back in the day. And it was a spaceship that had a more powerful engine than a Rolls Royce. It was the first Bentley in over 20 years that was a completely different car than a Rolls Royce, because really, from 31 to 52, they were all rebadged Rolls Royces with slightly more powerful engines, and the suspensions were tuned differently. But this had a full Moliner body that was unique to Bentley. It even has sport seats. Now, granted, I wouldn't call these very sporty, but back in the day, they were sporty, I guess. Um, there was one aspect to this that was, let's just say this was the Bugatti Veyron of its day, not just because of the speed and the look and the design. The price in today's dollars, back in 1952, $1 million. Okay, so more power is great and all, but really, I've never met one person said, yeah, the Bentley Continental GT, that's a great car and all, but it doesn't have enough power. So in this case, you got more power, but what does that really translate to? Um, two things. Number one, you put your foot on this thing, and it just pulls like a freight train, more so than the last car, and it's really noticeable. But then the second thing, I've been driving this thing for now, I want to say 200 miles, and where we've driven these cars before, the average indicated MPG has been something like 12 to 16. Here, consistently, especially on roads like this where it's like sweepers or longer straights, been about 22 MPG. That is incredibly impressive for a 12-cylinder engine in this size car. Willkommen bei Atlantische Havzen. My apologies in advance for butchering the Norwegian language, but I felt we need to stop and take a look at a very cool public structure here. And this is a 5.2 mile stretch of road that connects two towns on this bay here. And there's a very interesting history to it. So basically, they've got a series of eight bridges over an archipelago. I mean, incredibly cool. So they've got all these little islands that are connected, and the bridges, they vary in length. So the shortest one is 171 feet, the longest is 961 feet. But the most interesting is actually the second longest, if you can believe, and that's this one here. And the reason why it's the most interesting is, notice how it's cantilevered, it has a very unique presence to it. Um, well, how did this whole thing come about? Well, the idea was they wanted to connect two separate cities. As a matter of fact, the town line is right in underneath the span of that bridge. Anyway, it was originally envisioned as a railway back in the 20s. The idea fell off the shelf. Then it was picked up again in the late 70s. And the idea was, you know what? Let's scrap the railway. Let's do a road. This way we can get some tourism traffic. So they kicked off construction in 1983, the summer of 1983. And it lasted for six years. And in those six years, there were 12 major windstorms that kind of slowed down production. But it ultimately was opened in uh, July of 1989. Now, how do you pay for something like this? Well, this is Norway, so if you were to go to buy that Bentley, you would probably pay another whole Bentley just in taxes here in Norway. So you'd think they'd have a lot of money to pay for public uh, projects like this. Wrong. Well, what they did here was pay 75% from public grants, and they said 25% has to come from tolls. So they put a toll booth up, and the logic was, let's keep it going, until, oh, I don't know, 15 years, and hopefully we'll get our money back. Well, it turns out there was so much tourism traffic here that they took the toll booth down when it was paid off in only 10 years. 
Now, I am from New York, and granted, I wasn't alive when they built all the bridges, but they told the public they would bring down the tolls once they paid off the bridges. Well, it's over 50 years later, and they have yet to bring those tolls down. So I think New York needs to learn from Norway. So in summary, what do we got? Really what we have here is more than the sum of its parts because back in 2003, you had one Continental focused on one guy. Now you have four derivations of Continental GT focused on four different guys or gals. Um, and really the difference is what flavor of driving dynamics do you want? Do you want something like the V8S? I mean, obviously, that's the one that gets me excited. That's the one I would want. But now this one, the W12, has more room to be a luxury car. Now, this is but one man's opinion. So I would be interested in what you guys would choose out of the range. But we got a lot to cover here because there's a lot that goes into these decisions. Now, remember in our Ferrari film, we talked about the tax schemes that affect these cars. It's part of the reason why you have a four liter V8 and a six liter W12. So let me know which one of the four you would choose, but not just which one, why and what region of the world you live in. So I wanna know about that tax scheme. And let us know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV all one word, Moto Man TV all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And until next time, I say hi hi. So here we are in a country where you, you just don't see cars like this. And the taxes are just so high on cars, normal cars, no one would buy a car like this. Um, so to see one of these is something very special. But to see eight of them together, it's, it's not like the second coming of Jesus, it's the entire Last Supper. <laughs>